let's get started. Welcome everyone and happy Thursday. Thank you for joining us virtually for Alina Hayes Artist Talk. I'm Pamela Yaga, the Exhibitions Manager here at the American Museum of Ceramic Art in Southern California. Amoka champions the art, history, and creation of technology of ceramics through exhibitions, collections, outreach, and studio programming. Today's Artist Talk celebrates the exhibition Bloop by Alina Hayes on view at Amoka Vault Gallery through August 22nd. Joining us today is Genevieve Kaplan, our Associate Director of Communications Stewardship. They will be monitoring the chat and answering any questions you may have. This event will be recorded, so if you're a bit camera shy, feel free to turn off your video and politely stay muted until the end of the talk. Towards the end of the talk, we will have a brief Q&A portion for anyone with lingering questions about our artist, Alina Hayes. A little bit about Alina. Um, they were born in Ukraine. Alina Hayes grew up in Brooklyn, New York, the daughter of a jeweler and musician and granddaughter of a potter and surgeon. Alina Hayes views the handwork as part of their heritage. She began her studies in the School of Visual Arts before relocating to Los Angeles in 2005, where she completed both her Bachelor of Arts and Masters of Art, emphasis in ceramics degrees in, has a degree in California State University, Northridge, Hayes completely currently serves as an adjunct professor at Ventura Community College. The exhibition Bloop by Alina Hayes is all view at the Bulk Gallery of Mocha. So if you guys ever get a chance before August 28th, come and come and see these little bloops because they're adorable and I love walking in there. <laughs> and now I'll turn it over to Alina who will start their talk. Okay, perfect. All right. Well, um, I just wanted to really quickly say thank you to um, Beth and Pam. Um, you two have been incredibly kind and generous um, throughout this process, and I really appreciated your input. And of course, thanks to Amoka. Um, my first show was a student show at the old location many, many years ago. And I'm so honored to have my first solo show um, be inside the vault. I feel like I've come full circle and I'm very excited. And thank you to all who have taken the time to be here with us virtually. Um, I'm happy to have this opportunity to talk about the show and the process and the creation of Bloop. So I suppose that I should probably begin with procrastination. Now I am a natural maker. So uh, while I do procrastinate in my personal life quite a bit, I always know what to do and make in the studio but suddenly my hands didn't want to make the objects that I proposed to make. And um, this was kind of new to me because I've seen this sort of phenomenon happen in grad school to other classmates, but um, this was a first for me. And I always found it funny. I was like, well, why don't you just make whatever the heck you always make? You know, why are you making such a big thing about this? But of course, um, right around the same time, I came across an article in the New York Times called Why You Procrastinate by Charlotte Lieberman. And I'll quote, procrastination isn't a unique character flaw or a mysterious curse on your ability to manage time, but a way of coping with cha uh, challenging emotions and negative moods induced by certain tasks, boredom, anxiety, insecurity, frustration, resentment, self-doubt and beyond, and it made perfect sense. I was terrified to fail. And I realized that I had built up the idea of the art that I was going to make into such grand you know, amounts in my head that I just couldn't wrap my head around it. And I was stalling and I was having what I like to call paralysis by analysis. And um, to quote one of my students, uh, we were having a crit and she basically broke down and said, I want to make good art so bad. And of course, you know, that's ridiculous. Why does art have to be good? And what is good art anyway? And of course, the more you think about it that way, the more contrived your art becomes. And so when I had submitted um, my proposal for the show several years ago, I had just graduated and completed my thesis show. And one of the pieces was titled Carry Me. It was a wall hung piece with interconnected pieces resting upon each other and supporting each other and carrying each other. And um, it spanned about seven feet long. And the work was very purist and highly crafted and it had these sort of 
very pretty finishes and um, it was very ceramic proper. And um, the clay was definitely the star of the show. And in my graduate school experience, um, oops, sorry, I moved ahead. Um, in my graduate school experience, um, you go through tons of critiques where you talk about concepts and ideas and people asking you endless questions. Why do you make what you make? What are you trying to communicate? And I think I was just so overwhelmed and I was burnt out and I was ready to be done with it. And very quickly after graduation, I began teaching at Ventura College. And so between teaching and having a family and making art, I was always falling short. Um, or at least that's how I felt. And that was before the pandemic even started. So if I were dedicating time to my family, my art would suffer. And if I needed to put in extra hours teaching, my family would feel left out and, and so on. And so I was in this endless cycle and the idea that a mother um, should want to do more than just live vicariously through her kid um, is quite a foreign concept for a lot of people. Um, you know, I get questions from other moms like, oh, um, what is it you do exactly? And you do this when? You, you, oh, you make art. Oh, for yourself? Oh, so you, you do this during your kid's hockey practice? And so there was this sort of this idea of um, this guilt, you know, that somehow doing this was wrong. And of course, I wasn't making any more babies. I was making bloop. And so I would just walk into my garage studio and I would make. And I wasn't making anything in particular or anything for a specific purpose. The show was still quite a ways away. So I knew I had plenty of time. And I tried to think as little um, as possible and uh, make work as playfully and intuitively as I could. And I tried to remind myself not to work, um, not to worry about the outside noise and, and to just make. And so I would get on the wheel and I would throw different sized pieces, and then I would combine them to create these forms, these biomorphic blobs. Um, and here you can see, let's see if it's even not working, there we go. Um, and here you can see, you know, some of them are quite complex and are made up of, um, quite a few wheel thrown parts and they're very large in size. Some are a little bit more uh, minimalist that are only composed of several wheel thrown pieces and they all vary in scale. And some are quite playful. Uh, here we have poop and bloop, thanks to uh, the reference to my dog, my pug Norma. Um, and some, some are quite suggestive. Um, and it's kind of funny, I had a student, I guess, look up or Google my work and they found one of my pieces in Pinterest. And when she, uh, when underneath it, it said, if you'd like to see more like this, click here. And if you clicked on it, it would take you to a bunch of butt plugs. And so I thought to myself, yes, you know, like this is really, I've made it. This is incredible. My work is being related to butt plugs, but seriously. Um, I would look at and think about the work of Ruth Duckford and Barbara Hepworth. And I always, I discovered Barbara's work uh, right around that time. And I found it so interesting because whenever people would reference my work, I heard Henry Moore's name quite a bit, but um, not a lot of people, or actually nobody mentioned Barbara's Hepworth work because um, I don't know why, but um, I found that her work actually spoke to me a lot more than, than Henry Moore's work. And they both worked together at the same time and they were friends. So I just find it kind of sad that um, she wasn't as, as recognized. Um, and also around the same time, Jason Briggs had come and done a workshop um, at Ventura College. And I found some similarities in our process. Uh, he would also throw closed forms and then combine them together to uh, make these objects. But what I found interesting was where my work would end, um, his was just beginning. And then of course he would uh, spend months on developing these surfaces 
which I just don't have the patience for. But I was blown away um, by actually being able to hold one of his pieces. So one day, uh, my son and I, we were drawing together and we were coming up with characters for a children's book. And I drew this little blobby guy that kind of looked like the work that I was making. And I wrote in the title line, Blue. And after, um, I often use language and metaphors and similes in the titles of my work. So when I looked up if Bloop actually meant anything um, in the dictionary and I read the description or, the, you know, saying to ruin, botch, a clumsy mistake. I thought to myself, huh, isn't that ironic? Because it really was the serendipitous moment um, and how I really did feel um, in, in, at, at that time. And I added an extra O um, to the word to kind of abstract it, but also to um, give it its own hashtag. So if people wanted to search it on social media, they could do that all in one place. But you see, I had a dilemma. When the bloop were in the leather heart stage, here on the left hand image, um, they had this very easygoing personality. And those of you who are makers, you know that the leather hard clay is quite yummy um, and very forgiving and just wonderful. Um, and it was fun and, and they didn't take themselves too seriously. And it had this wonderful, um, luscious surface. Um, but then when they were fired and glazed, they took on this very serious, somber look. Um, and I didn't want to reveal that about the work or, or myself. Um, so I started thinking about alternate solutions to hide um, the somber interior and, um, and just looking at uh, room temperature glazes as they're sometimes called. So those of you who are makers and work with clay, um, you know that sometimes room temperature glazes are considered basically anything that doesn't require a kiln um, to finish your work. So that could be anything like paint, uh, stucco, um, you know, plaster, a variety of things that you can apply. And um, so I really started thinking outside the box and I came across this rubber spray material used by the auto industry. And the moment I applied the paint, um, the form became vibrant and alive and, and more joyful and playful. And so at this point of the making, I, it's just me. Uh, it's me making these in my studio. Um, I no longer have the, you know, the people around me to critique the work or give me feedback on the work, just me sitting in the garage. So I'm not really sure you know, how the work is going to be received. And so I was invited to show uh, to a show in St. Pedro named Hard Mud Soft Threads by um, Carolyn Lilberte. And the reaction to the work was actually quite welcoming. I'm not sure if it was because people were curious what the, what the surface was and um, they'd not seen something like that before. And one of the things I noticed, and you can see it on image to the left, was the way the work was positioned on the pedestal. And it looks like it's facing um, the tapestry or the, the weaving that's on the wall. And it's kind of interesting. It looks like the bloop is enjoying the artwork. So if you were to stand next to it, you know, both of their backs would be turned to us. And I thought that was kind of kind of interesting. And I started looking and thinking about them as these animated characters. And here on the left is the little nerds candy guy. And then I remembered watching uh, a flower sack animation. Um, this is an assignment that's usually assigned to first year animation students where they're required to animate a sack. And I remember thinking like, wow, it's really kind of crazy how, um, how little uh, is required in terms of a if in terms of form for our minds to associate certain traits and gestures. So I started posing. Um, I started posing them together and started to create these little scenarios or vignettes um, and started thinking about what feelings they might express, uh, but also may elicit from others and viewers. Um, and these two pieces were accepted into the Enseca Biennial Show in Virginia in 2020, 
And of course, many people didn't get to see the show because the conference was canceled. And as you know, we were on the brink of pandemic as we now know it. So, um, but I noticed that the work was beginning to get recognized. And one of the things that I found surprising was how vocal people were about the work. And um, I remember they had these very visceral reactions to them. And one time a man said, oh, I look like the blue one when I come home from work. And I was really happy that um, they were relatable and approachable and people had something to say about them. Um, I graduated from CSUN where I studied with Patsy Cox, um, an incredible artist, um, and she used to call us misfits. And I think now it's one of the best compliments because we were. And um, I think now I'm finally coming into the terms that being a misfit may actually kind of be wonderful. Um, and so I always welcome people's re reactions to the work. I'd love to hear what people have to say um, because I am so close to these objects. It's really hard for me to sometimes stem back and see, see them objectively. So anytime somebody has a comment or a suggestion I love it because then I sometimes incorporate it into future work. And I remember one time someone mentioned, oh, you should give them little arms. And I, and I looked at them and at that moment, I, I realized that um, none of them had hands or arms or any sort of really little nubbins that might be viewed as hands. And it was just so weird that I had subconsciously rendered them completely helpless. I have denied, the, the thing that is probably the most important uh, to me. And of course, that's exactly how I was feeling because I was very uh, feeling very helpless. Um, like my hands were tied behind my back in a lot of ways, especially now that things are really unraveling with the pandemic and, and um, the, um, the riots and all the things that were happening um, that summer. And so I was feeling a lot of pressure um, I was feeling pressure to perform, pressure to show up, pressure to present a happy persona. You know, you always put on a happy face, um, hide, you know, the, the feeling of, 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 of fear or, um, you know, something that you might be experiencing. Um, and so um, this was the, this was the beginning of the, of the pandemic uh, where nothing was certain. And you know, as a mom, as a partner, you try to comfort your loved ones and tell them that everything is going to be okay. Um, and I wanted to visually express um, this weight that I was feeling. Um, so I made this squishy form and I ended up um, making it pink. And I began building these blob-like large, um, for heavy forms directly on top of it. And I wanted to encapsulate it in the middle from both sides and completely swallow it under the weight, almost squeezing it like a sponge. And by this point, I can tell by the photos that my son was being homeschooled because I had completely moved um, all my work um, into the dining room so I could be there and I can still continue to make work. And of course, as you see, one of the pieces did in fact cave in from the weight and the pressure um, and had to be rebuilt. But, you know, perhaps that's, that's exactly what was supposed to happen. So I would build these um, coil by coil. And um, it was this sort of numbing, repetitive process. Uh, but it was also comforting in some way because it took your mind off of a lot of things. And at this time, um, um, you know, it was, it was kind of like add coil, compress, paddle, score, smooth. Add coil, compress, paddle, score, smooth. And at the time it was quite difficult making work because there was so much happening in the world and there was so much anger and there was so much frustration and violence and upheaval that, you started to think to yourself, you know, what is the relevance of all this? Like, why am I even doing this? What is the point of all this? And, you know, I, I of course, continued to make work. Um, 
And then I fired the pieces individually in the kiln. And then once the work was finished, I then stacked um, it on top of each other. Um, and on top, um, I made this small mango shaped little piece um, that kind of snuggles on top, sort of as a reminder to myself to know that this too will end and we will come um, up, come away on top of it and make it through. Um, and I've always enjoyed work that um, had a feeling of belonging, uh, work that is made specifically to fit something, you know, fit within something else. And here I have the work of Sam Chung and um, he, he, his piece titled Place Setting, which of course is a place, um, is a play on words, but he uses topography maps to construct um, these dishes nestled into one another and the tea set of Norlin Nasri where all the cups and the teapots are safely tucked away in their respective areas. And I always thought about and was interested in hanging ceramics on walls. And I know sometimes people think that hanging ceramics is precarious, but I find that it is a place that is usually reserved for paintings. And I've always felt that the clay belong there too. So to create these pieces, I would roll out a base slab um, and outline the forms that I wanted to make with a pencil. And then I would attach a two inch wide slab to the edge, kind of continually outlining the pieces. And then I would paddle them with a wooden spoon to get them to curve. And then once I did that, then I would continue coiling the forms to continue um, to close them off. And then at that point, I kind of look at the piece and see how I feel. And then if I want to add additional elements, I go ahead and I add um, a wheel thrown parts. Um, if I if I think you know it, I need it. So here is a, just a brief video of me working on one of these pieces. Um, so I attach the coil, and I roll my coils kind of thick, but then I thin them out, and that allows me to attach less coils and make work quickly. But I'm also kind of a lazy ceramicist, um, and I love making closed forms because then you really only have to smooth out the exterior. And there's something that I've always found intriguing about closed forms because you, I feel like my process hides there, I hide in there. Um, and then of course, once I'm done constructing the form, then I meticulously smooth um, all the surfaces. And my students would make fun of me and say that I have a smoothing sickness, but the rubber material tends to be quite thin. So you need to apply quite a few coats. Um, so having a form be very smooth helps with the overall surface because otherwise you see every imperfection and when your work is clean, um, that tends to distract from it quite a bit. So back to the closed forms, whoopsie. Back to um, closed forms for a minute. Um, as I said, I've always been intrigued by closed forms, but when I was writing my thesis, I read a book called Live Form by Jenny Sorkin. And in it, she talks about an artist, Marguerite Waldenheim, who was this Bauhaus potter, um, and she coined the phrase live form. And to quote, it is where a wheel thrown vessel in which the body of the craftsman, notice the body of the craftsman, not the artist, but the body of the craftsman through his or her physical manipulation of the clay determines the size and the shape of the most intimate spaces of the vessel itself, its girth, the weight and the delicacy of the rim, the strength and the placement of the handle and so on. Her term conveys the artist's embodiment of form itself through indexical presence that becomes ever present and unceasing. And I just thought it was so beautiful, the fact that, you know, the artist becomes part of the work and then they're, they're always a part of it. And then I always think about this wonderful material, clay. And I've always found it fascinating that clay might be the only sculptural material that you can actually experience from within. Um, you know, you can't do it with glass. 
can't do it with wood, um, can't really do it with metal. And it allows itself to be stretched to its limits. And it is a material that is so resilient um, and it is strong as it is fragile. And I've always found a kinship with clay in that resiliency. We immigrated to United States from Kharkiv, Ukraine in 1990. At that time, I don't think many people knew where Kharkiv was or even heard the name of it. I used to think that I was resilient because of my upbringing by a single mom, but seeing how stubborn and ferocious Ukrainian people are, I'm beginning to think that maybe that is the real reason. Um, this is actually our visa photo. I guess they photographed women together with their children. And this war had completely scattered all the remaining families that I have in Ukraine all around Europe, which made me long for the innocence of childhood and play and simpler times even more. So I always think about this idea of fitting in and what it means to belong someplace. Um, growing up in Brooklyn, New York, I never really felt like I fit in. There was a lot of us, a lot of kids from different demographics, Chinese, Pakistani, African-American, Jewish, um, you know, from all walks of life. And um, at the same time, I still didn't kind of feel like I, I belonged anywhere. And um, people from the Soviet Union were not very liked. Um, I was mostly surrounded by Irish and Italian kids because I went to Catholic school. And so I tried to get rid of my accent as quickly as possible in an effort to camouflage. So oftentimes I would make, in the work, I would make these square pegs and I would stick them into these squishy forms um, to make them fit almost as um, an act of defiance, like I belong here. Um, but I also think about first impressions. Um, I am terrible at first impressions. Uh, most of the time uh, when people meet me, they don't like me very much. <laughs> and um, I am a, a terrible judge of character. Uh, I think mostly because I just take people um, at face value. And um, I guess that's not how it works. People don't usually show their true colors at the very beginning, right? It's hard to gauge. Uh, what people are really like. So I will sometimes physically impress shapes into wet clay and see what sticks, um, thinking about impressions and clay, of course, always obliges. And then I think about, especially lately, um, about the roles we play, about roles as people. And I started thinking about um, the exterior rubber coating as a type of clothing. Um, so you see when you glaze a piece and you fire it in a kiln, the two become part of a whole. And um, you can't really remove the glaze from the piece once it's fired. I mean, I, I suppose if you really try to, you probably could, but even then the piece will not return to what it was prior to the firing, right? And so I often think about these sayings like, dress for success and fake it till you make it, best foot forward. And it sounds to me like, you're applying this fake exterior to cover up the true interior. And of course, I've been doing this my whole life. Um, and so the wonderful thing about this rubber is that you can peel it away. And once you peel it, you sort of reveal the naked, raw, and vulnerable form underneath. And if we could just sit and take a moment to enjoy the satisfying sound. Ah, uh, that last one was a good one. So I started thinking about um, the surface as a type of skin. And I would try to apply the rubber in a way that it looked like it was the skin of some sort of exotic citrus fruit. And at this point, um, I began thinking of these pieces as quite toy-like. And depending on how much time I had to work that week, um, I would shift scale. So if I didn't have a lot of time, I would work smaller. Um, but also coming from a functional pottery background, 
Um, I really appreciate the intimacy that you could have with a handheld object as opposed to a larger sculpture. And being able to hold an object in your hands and feel its weight, I think can be quite satisfying. Um, kind of like what you, you know, when one holds a, a cup, for example. And then I also, you know, I, I realize uh, we don't live in a vacuum. Um, and I'm a pretty sensitive person and I feel like external things obviously tend to make their way into the work. And here I have a couple of these poor baby hummingbirds that didn't make it outside the, the nest. And um, to the right is a work um, of an artist. Her name is Hannah Donvan. And I'm embarrassed to say, I saved this image um, of her work on my phone several years ago. And it wasn't until this present presentation that I looked up who she was. And it turns out she actually lives in Kharkiv, Ukraine, and her shop's name is Manuni Shop, which means little ones. And she was making these cloud couples. And I just thought it was so kind of ironic, the, the, the connection that I didn't realize was there that I was drawn to. Um, and so I started arranging these pieces in couples, I think partly because almost for comfort, but also to see how they interacted to, together and just thinking about um, all, the, all the people and all the family members that, that couldn't be together and were alone during the, this time. But also I started really considering what color could bring to the table. I think when you're glazing your work um, or just using raw clay, um, the work tends to be a little bit more subdued, but I loved how loud this work was becoming. And so I started borrowing um, ideas and colors from mid-century abstract painters um, like uh, Ilya Bolotovsky um, and then um, the work of Frederick Hemersley. And you can see the curvature of the form and the color have a great similarity here. Um, and also I came across this wonderful artist. Her name is Dorothy Fratt. And I think her use of red is just beyond anything that um, I had ever seen before. But also, you know, I wanted to use color um, to create a moment of repose, um, a moment of calmness. And um, I think, you know, I think of the words of Richard Serra and I'll quote what he, what he says. Um, what interests me is the opportunity for all of us to become something different from what we are by constructing spaces that contribute something to the experience of who we are. And so I'd like to hope um, that in some way, my work might delight the senses of, um, and, and in some small way, make the viewer's day a little bit better um, and a little bit brighter uh, with its presence. So um, I'd like to thank you for joining me today and to listening to me speak. And I'd love to hear you if you have any questions or comments at this time. Thank you. So I will stop share now. Thank you so much, Alina. Thank you. I loved it. I also haven't heard um, Barbara Hepworth's name for a while. I don't know why. Let me... Okay. All right. And thank you so much, Alina. Now, if anyone has any questions, feel free to either type them in um, into the chat, and then I'll be happy to read them out loud unless you feel very brave. Um, just use the hand raise emoji. <laughs> and, uh, and you can actually um, ask your question in person. Let's see. Robert says, thank you so much. I was very interested in the stories that you incorporated with your pieces and their evolution as human, human and memory forms. Thank you. And then a question from Sarah, I would like to hear more about your colors. Well, I, you know, I love using contrast um, as a point of departure 
Um, so I've always been, you know, even when I just worked with raw clay, it was always dark and light because um, I feel like they, you know, play off really well off of one another. Um, and I just love the opportunity to work with the neon bright colors that you can't get even, you know, even if you attempt using underglazes, um, you can only reach. So, you know, the, you, you won't get the neon um, color. And I love the, the reference to the, you know, the neon mid-century modern, very bright, poppy, pop culture, um, sort of colors and I a lot of the I didn't mention in the, in the talk but I've noticed that a lot of the higher end designers um, like Gucci um, and Fendi are starting to incorporate a uh, quite bright colors into their um, into their lines and I'm not sure if it just happens to be a coincidence or we're all just longing for for some positive, you know, kind of feedback and something more colorful in our lives um, to offset the, the seriousness that you know that is happening, that is happening in the world. Um, so yeah, I, I definitely love, um, and also you know, really quickly, just in terms of the 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 history of of ceramic art and tradition and breaking through the mold of you know, for example, wood firing, uh, which is something that's usually very brown, very earthy, and very limited in terms of the color palette. There you have this, you know, in your face, um, loud, very, very, very present. It's almost like, you know, you, whether you like it or not, it's there, um, sort of attitude. Um, and so, yeah. No, definitely. And color is just such a big enforcer for us as humans. So I feel yeah. like even walking into your exhibition, it's just like a nice shock <laughs> to the system. Or for me, it's great. But yes, um, it's it's something I think it's craved, honestly. Oh, um, thank you. And we have a couple more questions from Rebecca, who's asking, thank you, Alina. Beautiful, funny, delicious work. Is there anything you're working on now or for the future that you can share with us? Yes. Um, so I had just relocated to Las Vegas. And so it will definitely take me probably the next couple of months to set up my kiln um, and, uh, and get things started. But I need to be making, like I, right now I'm so, I'm bored out of my mind um, and my kiln isn't hooked up yet. And I've already gone and looked at their studio where I could pay to fire the work if I need to for the time being. But I, I've been wanting to embark on the use of neon lighting as part of the installation. Um, so I wanted to use possibly language um, and add that to this, incorporate that as part of the sculpture, so like a neon sign. Um, but also I have been, now that I've been packing, um, I've been obsessing with uh, these uh, texture paintings that you see all over, um, all over, um, I don't know if you guys seen them, but there's a bunch of artists working with this like, acrylic or or plaster paste that they apply on canvas and then they make these like arches and funky like you're you're gonna look at now now that you've heard it your phone is gonna like suggest it as part of your feed or something but anyway I looked at them and I I thought to myself oh my god this feels so much like clay slip like porcelain slip right that you're just spreading onto the canvas so I was thinking about trying those out and see maybe I don't know for the time being. Um, I also have another question from Judy. I'm so curious what the response has been for you regarding cold finishes in the ceramic world. Response, critique, etc. Is it still considered inclusive? Interesting, poignant, and wonderful question, Judy. Thank you quite so much. Um, funny you should say that. Um, so if you, I, I haven't, shown a lot of images of my um, earlier work. I, I almost exclusively made functional pottery for probably a, well over 10 years. And I know Judy for a long time. Uh, and both of our works has evolved uh, from, from functional to very sculptural work. And the moment I started using um, the cold finishes, um, I noticed um, I wasn't invited 
um, to the cup shows anymore. Um, I wasn't invited to the um, ceramic. Maybe it's an oversight. You know, I don't know. Maybe they think I don't make that type of work anymore. But I just find it funny that, you know, that you were a part of this group of people and you were in this sort of niche um, and they all know you're capable of making the work um, to then suddenly you're making something else. And then so they're like, oh, well, she's not really, you know, a part of this anymore, which I find continues my misfit um uh, you know a persona um that i don't really uh know where i fit you know do i fit strictly with the um ceramic you know process oriented uh traditional work or am i now part of the design slash you know now i'm no longer in the ceramic guild i'm in the art guild you know and and does it does it really matter I don't, I don't know. I feel like, you know, people should support the artist and then see where their work progress. I don't think it's practical for, you know, for you to, to be there. Um, and, and I don't think that it's practical for an artist to sit and make the exact same work for 40 years. Um, I think if, you know, I think a lot of people do that because again, they have a fan base and they're, they're, this is their bread and butter. This is how they make their living. But if you're evolving as an artist, I feel like the audience needs to go with you. And I, I agree. Like I, I have some followers that, you know, have began following my, my functional work and have unfollowed me as a result, because all of a sudden I was making these like weird you know, suggestive, funky, you know, objects, and they were no longer related, you know, they, they were no longer interested in seeing that anymore. No, it's completely understandable. I feel like a lot of artists get really scared of getting pegged for one particular piece of work. <laughs> yeah. Always an ongoing fear. I have another question from Robert. The process by which you make the pieces seems very integral to the creation of the forms, but the process is seems are mysterious in the completed forms. Is the process anything that you might consider making more visible? Good question. Thanks, Robert. Um, I have thought about um, making it more visible. And I, um, I've actually had, um, uh, I work with, a, with, an, with an arts dealer who requested that I make um, these very pinchy, um, pinchy looking um, bowls. And I resisted for a little while because I said, well, that's, that's not my work. I don't make that type of work. Um, but there is something satisfying about having the form, you know, be very sort of seeing the hand in the making. Um, but I would definitely consider it. I, you know, I, I, I never say never, right? Um, but, to me, I would have to figure out on how to make it my own. I think maybe there's that vulnerability in it. Um, and to me, I feel like the work has to be incredibly considered and highly crafted in order for it to be valuable in a weird way. It's like, it's my own thing. You know, I, I love pinchy work. I, I own, um, I admire it. I love people that make that type of work. But for some reason, my insecurity and my self-doubt, it's kind of like, well, if it's not this sort of fetish, clean, perfectly considered object, then somehow I feel like there's, there's not, not enough in it for me, which is, I don't know, in my, and strictly in my work, you know. So we'll see. I, I would consider it more visible. Yeah, I'm sure a lot of people actually do want to see what's behind the process. <laughs> yeah. And I have Kayla who, just to comment, what a wonderful lecture. I enjoyed every minute of it, but also we all kind of want to know what's next for Alina Hayes. Alina Hayes, um, as of the, at the moment, um, is not teaching classes and will not be for at least the unforeseeable future. So there will be a lot of work. Um, there will be a lot of uh, Instagram posts and Instagram lives because 
Um, I don't yet have a community out here. Um, and I think one of the ways that I can connect back with the people is to do that. Um, I know I'm sometimes reluctant um, to do that, but I, I really do want to share more. And also just setting up the studio and uh, reaching out and seeing what the art scene is like in Vegas. Uh, from what I understand, the hotels and casinos have quite large um, art uh, portfolios. Um, and so, yeah, um, that's it. Exciting. Make work. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, before we end, I do have a question. I love that you brought up Barbara, biggest crush on Barbara for work <laughs> in their work. I know historically they always pushed for abstract and I really enjoyed the fact that in your exhibition for Bloop, um, I feel like because you have access and you have a teenage son, <laughs> um, there's that accessibility to like pop culture yes. and influence in your work. Do you mind talking a little bit about that? Yes. Um, so there's definitely, that's funny. I completely forgot to, I didn't put it in the lecture and I meant to. Um, so I think a lot about Pokemon and I think about um, Among Us, um, and I actually made a few pieces that look like Among Us and I never finished them because I feel like the game kind of, it's, it's very transitory. I feel like things don't last very long. Um, so by the time you kind of learn about it, figure out what it's about, and then kind of try to incorporate it into your work, it's almost like it's not cool anymore. Um, you know, like there's that one and the memes, right? The memes are never ending. And it's funny, my son actually said, um, you know, dad, you, you look at memes that were cool two weeks ago on Facebook when you should have been looking at them on TikTok, you know, and, and it's true because in two, in two weeks, those memes, like if you didn't, you know, you didn't catch it. Um, so it's, it's interesting, but also it's, it's so, it moves so quickly that it's like, you really have to kind of pick and choose um, what's relevant, um, you know, but there's definitely, I've definitely had, um, you know, looked at the little different Pokemon characters and, and looked at like some of the funky, you know, things that they do um, and like the shapes that they have. And then I usually try to like abstract them and make them a little bit less complex, a little bit more sim simplified, you know? So yeah, so there's definitely, but it's, you know, keeping with the, with the pop culture um, is, I think is good because <laughs> it kind of keeps you in the loop. Um, you know, and keeps it relevant. But yeah, it's so fast. So fast, honestly, I, I can't even dive into meme culture in general. <laughs> um, oh, oh, good. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Alina. Um, now, if I, and thank you for everyone who joined us today. I hope we all have a chance to come out and see the bloops in person here at Amoka and Pomona. If you want to learn any more about Amoka and our current exhibitions, we're um, visit our website at amoka.org. A recording of this talk will be available on our website in the coming weeks, but join our newsletter and it'll let you know when that comes out for the recording. So we can, if you missed a part, you'll be able to see it online in the future. <laughs> All right. Any last words, Alina? No. Thank yeah. you so much for yeah. stopping by. Thanks for the questions. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Go see the show. Yes. Come visit us. <laughs> awesome. Have a nice day, guys. Thanks. Thanks. Bye.